We are halfway through a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And um, I've got a problem with this one. Does anyone know what, what we've got next, what, what today's fruit is? Anybody? I know you know, Mike. Carl, normally you are absolutely amazing on this, but today... I still didn't hear anyone say it. They're just laughing at me, which is fair enough. Absolutely fair enough. Who else has got a problem with this one? Yeah, this <laughs> We've all got a problem with this one, haven't we? We need God, don't we? We need God to, um, to give us his spirit so that we can demonstrate the life and the quality of God himself. And... Um, and I've got a problem with this because we can so, especially in church, and I'm not criticizing you, but in church life in general, we can so easily fall into the trap of sentimentality. That is not what this means. I must emphasize that from the top, right from the very start. It is not a comfort blanket. It is not just mere suburban niceness either. But the kindness of God, as we read in Scripture, that leads us to repentance. I'm going to read that Scripture from Titus again that I read at the top of the service. And bearing in mind that the fruit of the Spirit are listed in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 22. And there's nine of them. So we are now in the epicenter of the fruit, the core of the apple, so to speak. This is what the kindness of God leads to. When, this is Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we'd done. Even if we had done righteous things, it would never be enough. But because of his mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. There are tons of mini messages or memes about kindness in our culture today. I found four of them. I could have, found, I could have listed 400. They go like this. And there's nothing wrong with them at face value. Listen to these. Who would disagree? Kindness is always in fashion. Okay. Create a kindness culture. I like that one as well. That's good for our church life to remember. Kindness is free. Sprinkle it everywhere. Done much sprinkling lately? Or this one as well. In a world where you can be anything... Be kind. It's all right. It's all right. It's good advice. It's good advice. But isn't it funny, as I reflected on the hundreds of memes that were coming out about kindness, you only get memes like this or advice like this in a world that is historically and culturally unkind. Because we need to be reminded of these things. Now, these things wouldn't exist these slogans, these mini-messages, wouldn't exist in a world that was kind. We need God. We need the power of the Spirit to be poured into our lives to demonstrate the life of God, the life of Christ. So I do find it interesting on these two counts that we A, we need to be told these things, and B, that it is a named fruit of the Spirit. Now, many of you will know that I love um, uh, an old-school congregationalist theologian called P.T. Forsyth. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't wheeled him out for a while, uh, but he, he taught me the difference between uh, sentimentality and non-sentimentality, the difference between the two, and how church life can often fall between the gaps on these things. He said this, Yes. 
He said, we must avoid that particular effect, sentimental brand of late Victorian Christianity in which the mysteries and the paradoxes of the historic faith are traded for the mood and sensibilities of polite society. Kindness must not be reduced down to the sensibilities of polite society. And I love that, that God's word comes to us with these same words and these same ideas, but ramps them up, sanctifies them, and puts strength in them for us to endure in our day with the strength that is kindness. There's a proverb that says, a kind answer turns away wrath, yeah. A kind answer. It's, it's, there is real power and might in kindness, which is why I said it's not my favorite one, because I'm rubbish at it. And judging by some of the wry smiles on your faces, looks like some of us could do with sprinkling some kindness around, right? Some of this old gospel kindness. The kind of kindness that forces us to turn the other cheek when we're slapped on the other cheek. The kind of kindness that walks not one mile but two with your enemy. I love it. We must avoid that trade-off for polite society. David Goetz, I'm going to paraphrase another guy now, he said something like, it's not on the screen, sorry about that. He says, sometimes we can so flatten the gritty historical faith and all its mystery to the point where nothing surprises us except tragedy. Is that true? We can often so sentimentalize our faith, remove the grit and the rawness and the paradox and the mystery but nothing's a surprise. Just going to church. To meet with the risen Christ. We should come to church wearing hard hats. Not flowery hats. Not that you're wearing flowery hats. Praise the Lord. I'm sure it looked beautiful back in the day. But hard hats, right? Because we're dealing with the holy things of God. And one of the things that he says is a demonstration an outworking of God's presence within you and me is kindness. It's a supernatural gift. That's why Romans chapter 2 verse 4 said, without kindness there's no repentance. It says, or do you presume on the riches and kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It's not Kindness is not, you're okay, I'm okay, let's just tolerate each other and get along. No, kindness, as God has it, is a call to the repentant life and repentant faith. It's a call to salvation. And once saved and recognized that living faith, it's a call to walk in sanctification. It's gritty. It's real. Many of us know this. Some of us don't, and we should because Jesus died for you as well, and his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. And so, all one needs to do at this point is just reflect on God's kindness. And we realize our, our, the great chasm of need that we have. And it's a gift when we realize that chasm and that need. It's a gift, because it leads us to new life, doesn't it? It leads us to new life. So I, I think I've made my point there. I've only got two other very brief things to say, and I'm going to say them right now. Right now. Two things. I was wondering why kindness was right in the center of the nine fruits. It's number five. There's four before it, and there's four after it. Who said I couldn't do maths? My maths teacher did. Oh, yes. Why is it in the middle? When the Bible does this structurally with some of its ideas or verses or words, it's also communicating something else. And so I started getting more and more fascinated and I came to the conclusion that something else is going on with 
what God is doing with kindness by allowing Paul to place it in the middle of this great list. In the Bible, you come, sometimes you come across um, very specific laws of composition. The author has structured things in such a way as to communicate a message alongside the obvious message. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Is that nine or eight? I can't remember. But there's a very deliberate reason why it's that order. We talked about why love was at the front because it's like the overarching canopy over which all of them reside. The first quality that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, he said love is patient. That's what we discovered when we came to patience. The next quality, love is kind. So there's something going on here rooted in the fruit of the Spirit and God's holy love for us and the kindness of God. We, we, we can all be so short-tempered, can't we? And it's not a, it's not a quality that we want read out at our, uh, in, in a eulogy of our own funeral. It's not something we want other people to know about us, but we are an impatient race. More so now. More so now. But this law of composition is called cruciality. Wake up, everyone. Wake up. Laws of composition are very, very important, don't you know? Now, law of composition is an organized structure of the literature that the author has done deliberately. Cruciality is often the very central beating heart of that, that, that word that you're reading. And right in the middle of the fruit of the Spirit, the cruciality, the crux of the matter, where we get the word crucifixion from, actually, the most important thing to get, God has deemed it fit to place kindness. Out of that cruciality point, everything else emanates. Everything else radiates the fruit of the Spirit. Just as an example, we come across... Um, uh, oh, you got the picture. Okay, good. Um, Another, another t just to highlight the, uh, what cruciality is, uh, is, um, is found in Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 8, verse 27. Do you remember Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi and he says, who do, who do the people say I am? And, and they say, some people say this and some people say that. Then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from that moment on, that cruciality, Jesus says what's going to happen to him at the cross. It's a turning point in the gospel, a crucial turning point. I think I made a mistake a minute ago. I think I said that this was cruciality. It's not. We're going to come to it now. It's radiation. I'm getting so excited about this. I'm getting ahead of myself. The one that we have in the fruit of the Spirit is radiation, the center out of which everything radiates. That's what I meant to say. Sorry about that. Uh, so... Um, it's the, it, like, it acts like a, um, like a theological glue that holds all the others together, holding all of it together in the same way that um, the, the, the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2, everything in the letter to the Philippians from that hymn radiates out into the rest of the four chapters of Philippians. In the same way that in Paul's letter to Philemon, it's one chapter, but in verse 10, he says that Philemon has become my son. Everything else radiates around that. The entire gospel packed into 24 verses of one short letter. So a theological question from a pastor in a pulpit on a Sunday morning in a hot August would be this. What is your life radiating, church? What is the most important thing to you right now? That's what you worship. That's what your life will radiate. What is the most important thing? Now, we know we're in church, so we are going to say Jesus, right? But what does that mean? When we've got other important pressing issues, like family, and children, and health, and money, and on and on it goes, right? But what really is the most important thing that animates your life? What is the epicenter 
of your life? What message does your life, what message does my life communicate to the whole world? And we sang Jesus be the center because if Jesus is the center, then it will be him. If Jesus is not the center and you recognize this, then your own life is crying out for that life of Christ, for that redemption that he offers, that salvation, that deep cosmic need of him. Now, of course, before I come to my second point and my closing point, someone who is not a Christian can also be kind, can't they? <laughs> it's not as if everyone who's a Christian is perfectly good and everyone who's not a Christian is perfectly evil. No, no, no. Because kindness can be demonstrated by all those made in God's image. When people are kind, in the truest sense, they act like God. Because they're made by him, they've been potentially saved by him. And then they should live for him. The second one, I was also very excited about discovering this as well. Now, because God saves us and sanctifies us and calls us to follow him in transformative newness of life, that's a long sentence, but because he calls us to all of these things, because the Christian life is not static, it's not just a religion that we choose, but it's in fact Jesus, the Son of God, choosing us, right? The fruits of the Spirit are the means by which God does all of this saving work around our life. All of it. And since God forms his people to be like Christ, we can say that we are, historically we've been called the people of the book, Jews and Christians, and to a certain degree Muslims, people of the book, where the revealed, I'm not saying this is true for Islam, it's not, but where the revealed word of God has come to us over the centuries and millennia to reveal a God who is after us, who is after us, right? So can we say that we are a people who listen to Jesus? Can we say that? It's not a trap, I promise. Yes, we can, yes. Okay, so I want to share something absolutely beautiful as I close now. This is in the really well-known story, and um, you will know this really well, of Mary and Martha in Luke 10. Have you got your Bibles? There's Bibles in the, pew, in the seats there. Nearly said pews. Blimey. Um, there's Bibles in the seats. Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. Very familiar story, but this story is so profound. It speaks... Uh, a critique to our contemporary culture, it speaks life to our contemporary culture, and it speaks life to us today. Martha had invited Jesus into her home, which is a good thing. She showed Jesus hospitality, but then she goes and naffs it all up. Because she starts mincing around the kitchen, being super, super busy, so busy that the invitation of hospitality is lost in the noises that she's making from the kitchen. Any Marthas here? Except for the actual Martha? Martha, are you a Martha or a Mary? It's all this fussing and flapping around, even though the initial invitation has been good, right? But what was Mary doing? Should we read it? Actually, let's read it. I just realized I've not read it. Now. As they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good thing which will not be taken away from her. And I got thinking about this. 
We know it's a critique of Martha's fussiness and anxiety. We know that Jesus didn't judge her, but we also know that Jesus will not be bullied and bossed by her demands. Tell Mary to come and help me. Jesus says, no, this is not the way to live. What Mary has chosen is the way to live. What was she doing? What do Christians do? We listen to Jesus, do we not? And I, th I thought to myself, oh, I wonder what the Greek word for listen is here. I'm really pleased that today of all days, I'm mentioning a Greek word, because my friend from Watch It Baptist Church is sat right over there, and he's way better at Greek than I am. It's lovely to have you guys with us, by the way. But I was really excited about this discovery. The Greek word, don't worry, sweetheart, the Greek word for listening that Mary was doing, listening to Jesus, is akouo, from where we get the word acoustics from. We have acoustics here, don't we? So the, the issue at hand is this. This is what the fruit of the Spirit will lead us into. Listening to the acoustics of Jesus. That's all we're called to do. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Do you agree? Am I a genius? No. I just, I just discovered what was already there. That the church is called to be a people who listen to the acoustics of Jesus. And what a melody that is. What a, what a life-giving freedom song that is for his church and for the world, right? And so no wonder Jesus told Martha not to be anxious and angry that Mary had chosen the one thing necessary and that one thing was the acoustics of Jesus. Beloved, when we listen to these acoustics of Christ, we will grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Jesus, keep us in the good soil of your saving kindness, I pray, Lord, and may we know, Lord, the sweet breath of your Spirit ever close to us as you transform us into the image of your beloved Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.